This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. I've come to the microphone today to read another part of the wonderful book, The History of the Inquisition. Omitted history that not only we Christians but everybody should read. Because when everybody learns about the omitted history, then everybody would turn Christian. I tell you, because in their heart... Everybody seeks the truth and loves the truth. Well, the Bible says that man of himself does not seek God. That's why we have the election of God. God selects his people. But still, I think that it is absolutely important to teach the people out there the truth. And you cannot understand the present if you don't have any knowledge of the past. And you cannot make any predictions of the future if you do not have any knowledge of the past and understand the present. That's why history is so important. That's why God, in his book, the Bible, wrote so many history. We call that prophecies. But a prophecy is only history written in advance. The book of the Word of God, the Bible, is full of prophecies, meaning full of history. So let's learn from that, take that, and then see how our world really works. Because we will only understand the working of our world today when we have the right view on history. But what they teach us in the schools, what they teach us in the universities, the books that you can openly get in libraries today, 2017, and what is openly taught from the pulpits, whether in the Roman Catholic or even in an apostate Protestant church, has nothing to do with real history. Books like this, History of the Inquisition, from Philip van Limborch, from 1692, 
are omitted from all the places I formerly named. Go to your pastor and ask him about the Inquisition, and let's see what he answers to you. And he will probably say, well, the Inquisition doesn't, doesn't even exist anymore. That's the thing of the past. Today we are civilized, you know. That's what they told me when I was in school. Okay, the Inquisition is not the office of the Inquisition anymore. It is now the office of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. It changed its name, but its nature still is the same. My point being, Rome never changes. They give new names to old wines. That's what they're very, very good in. You can also call that sophistry and casistry. Whatever name you give it, the point remains the same. The Jesuits have been founded and swore, and every Jesuit swears with his oath, allegiance to the Pope and to extirpate heretics and to absolutely diminish, demolish, destroy, completely and utterly take out of this world Protestantism. Protestantism is the return to apostolic Christianity, to the Christianity of the very first century, of the apostles, right after Jesus Christ went up to heaven. That is the basic Christianity as we can call it. And they want to destroy that. The devil doesn't care which lie you believe. Whether you're in the Roman Catholic Church and believe their lies, you're in Islam and go into, as a Muslim, into their minarets and uh, their churches, or you're a Jew and go to the synagogues, or you are a Buddhist or a Hinduist and go to their temples, it doesn't matter. Because any of those religions that I just named, when you attend them, you are lost anyway. You will not be a child of God. And that's the thing the devil wants. Not many children of God. So what he really actually fights is real biblical Christianity. On all fronts, he attacks the Bible, he attacks the Bible readers, he attacks the Bible by publishing so many different corrupted versions that people do not know anymore which Bible to take. Well, there's only one Bible today that we can take, and that's the 1611 King James Bible. But, you know, I don't want to spend the whole time of this video telling you about the reason why I'm reading this book. I hope that you understood that by now, and I will continue now then reading the book and the page that we left off, um, this is uh, page 59 in the book, as you can see, with the mystery. And uh, there has been a little part that I've been possible to read in advance. That's why some things are highlighted, but uh, not that much. For the rest, I will rely on the Holy Spirit to lead me in this reading of a well-put reading. Uh, nice pronunciation correct reading of the words and an understanding that uh, can explain some things that we come across during the reading here. So, the introduction done. I'm going to begin reading on the end of page 59, as we just established. Yeah, 59. You know, we have had this... Um, this paragraph here and we read it and we know that it was about images and idols yeah? and we continue now on thus the mystery thus the mystery of this iniquity worked till at length under the region of irene and constantine her son a synod was packed up of such bishops as were ready to make any decrees that should be agreeable to the roman pontiff and the empress now, who are Irene and Constantine? Well, I'm going to put a link um, into there that is from the 8th century, the 700s, the late 700s. And I will put a Wikipedia link in there that you can look up who Irene and Constantine are, uh, at least from Wikipedia. But you can also, of course, use other sources and then make yourself a little bit more familiar about the time that is going on, what, what we are reading here. 
Now they met at Nice. Nice. Uh, I, I, I should call it Nice. Yeah, you know, that is uh, in the south of France, that city where the Nicene Creed comes from. Nicaea. I don't know why they called it Nicaea at the time. Now it's called Nice. Uh, or you can also pronounce it the French way, that is Nice. Maybe that's more interesting and uh, understandable when I just use the French pronunciation of that town, that is Nice. They met at Nice to the number of about 350 uh, bishops and clergymen. In this venerable assembly, it was decreed, why is that assembly venerable? <laughs> it was decreed, quote, that holy images of the cross should be consecrated and put on the sacred vessels and vestments and upon walls and boards and private houses and public ways and especially that there should be erected images of the Lord God, our Saviour Jesus Christ, of our Blessed Lady, the Mother of God, of the Venerable Angels and of all the Saints. And that whosoever should presume to think should presume to think or teach otherwise, or to throw away any painted books, or the figure of the cross, or an image or picture, or in genuine relics of the martyrs, they should, if bishops of clergymen or clergymen, be disposed, or if monks or laymen, be excommunicated. Unquote. Where do I even start with commenting on this? I think I better keep my comment for myself. You know what my thoughts are about quote unquote our blessed lady yeah? of the venerable angels. How can man this, this is something I really want to know. How can man make any image of an angel when he never saw one? And of all the saints well, the saints of the Bible are not the saints of the Roman Catholic Church. The difference is, the saints of the Bible, like we can also read in Revelation, in uh, Revelation 17, that the whore is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus Christ, the saints mentioned in the Bible are the living are the people who adhere to the true word of God. And all the saints that are to, taken here to make relics of, to make idols of, are dead people. And there are even all pagan gods who were just renamed with Christian names. And they called those saints. So I don't really want to go into a longer comment than that. I hope that you understand the point that what the Roman Catholic Church teaches here is absolute apostasy. And uh, we will see that, I think, in the next sentence that I highlighted in the green color. Then they pronounced anathemas upon all who should not receive images or who should apply what the scriptures say against idols to the holy images, or who should call them idols, or who should willfully communicate with those who rejected and despised them. Yeah. So this was at the Second Nicene Council, and I will put a Wikipedia link on the Second Nicene Council here, and I will put a New Advent Org link of the Second Nicene Council here. A New Advent, that is the website of the Roman Catholic Church Encyclopedia of today. So you can consult their own encyclopedia, their own publications on what they have to say about this. But I think it is very profound that we understand that at this Second Nicene Council, yeah, the Council of Nice in the south of France, the second one after 325, they pronounced anathemas on all who should not receive images. So when you adhere to what I have been reading to in the last part, as you probably remember, the second commandment, when you adhere to that, to the word of God and his second commandment, then you are being pronounced anathema. Yeah? 
they, they pronounced anathemas upon all who should not receive images or who should apply what the scriptures say against idols. So when you uphold the scripture, sola scriptura, you are pronounced anathema by the Second Nicene Council of the 8th century. Adding, the author continues, according to custom, long live Constantine and Irene his mother. Damnation to all heretics, damnation on the council that roared against venerable images. The Holy Trinity has disposed them. What Holy Trinity! Irene and Constantine approved and subscribed these decrees, and the consequence was that idols and images were erected in all the churches, and those who were against them treated with great severity. This council, the Second Nicene Council, was held under the popedom of Hadrian I, and thus, by the intrigues of the popes of Rome, iniquity was established by law and the worship of idols authorized and established in the Christian Church, though contrary to all the principles of natural religion and the nature and design of the Christian revelation. The Christian revelation is the understanding of the Word of God. And in the Word of God, contrary to what the Second Nicene Council teaches here, it is forbidden by God it is an abomination to him to bow down to images and idols to worship them or even to fathom something from the heaven above the earth below or the waters under the earth it is an abomination to God and the church here decrees the popes here decree Pope Hadrian I here decrees that that is exactly what you must do when you are a member of the Orthodox or Catholic or universal, quote-unquote, Christian Church. That's what he orders you to do. And the punishment is anathema. And when you are anathematized, you are free to be killed by anyone. You have no right whatsoever of the Pope to take your next breath. Here in the Second Nicene Council, in the first, they were establishing the Trinity in 325. And here in the second, they were establishing the worship of idols which God's which God absolutely forbids. So the question is, who do you pay your allegiance to? God, who wrote the law, or the Pope, who changes the law? The author continues, it is true that this decision of the Council did not put an entire end to the controversy. Platina, which is another historian from the Roman Catholic Church, tells us that Constantine himself not long after annulled their decrees and removed his mother from all share in the government. The Synod also of Frankfurt, held about five years later, decreed that the worship and adoration of images was impious, condemned the Synod of Nice, which had established and ordered that it should not be called either the seventh or an universal, meaning Catholic, council. But, as the Roman pontiffs had engrossed almost all power into their own hands, all opposition to image worship became ineffectual, especially as they supported their decrees by the civil power and caused great cruelties to be exercised towards all those who should dare dispute or contradict them. For many years the world groaned under this anti-Christian yoke. Nor were many methods of fraud, imposture and barbarity left unpracticed to support and perpetuate it. 
as the clergy rid lords of the universe. They grew wanton and insolent in their power, and as they drained the nations of their wealth to support their own grandeur and luxury, they degenerated into the worst and vilest set of men that ever burned the earth. They were shamefully ignorant, scandalously vicious, well versed in the most exquisite arts of torture and cruelty, and absolutely divisit, uh, div divested of all bowels of mercy and compassion towards those who even at the smallest matter differed from the dictates of their superstition and impiety. Roman Catholo Catholicism is a superstitious religion and this is why the author chose us here to use this word from their dictates of superstition to make sure that we understand that this deals with the Roman Catholic Church. Now the infamous practices of that accursed tribunal, the Inquisition, the wars against heretics in the earldom of Toulouse, the massacres of Paris and Ireland, the many sacrifices they have made in Great Britain, the fires they have kindled, the flames they have lighted up in all nations where their power hath been acknowledged, witness against them and demonstrates them to be very monsters, to be the very monsters of mankind. So that one would really wonder that the whole world hath not entered into a combination and risen in arms against so execrable a set of men and extirpated them as savage beasts from the face of the whole earth who out of a pretense of religion a pretense of religion have defiled it with the blood of innumerable saints and martyrs, and made use of the name of the Most Holy Jesus to countenance and sanctify the most abominable impieties. But it pleased God and His good providence to take the remedy and cure of these evils into His own hand, and after fruitless attempts by men to bring about at last a reformation of religion, by his own wisdom and power. This is one of the most important sentences I have ever read in this book up to now. But it pleased God, looking down at all the abominations and the iniquities done by the so-called Church of Christ, the Roman Catholic Church, which is not the Church of Christ, of course, but by the quote-unquote so-called Church of Christ, looking down at all the iniquities and abominations they do, that the author says it pleased God in his good providence to take the remedy and cure of these evils into his own hands. It was God who started the reformation of religion by his own wisdom and power. And how did God start the Reformation? By putting his selected people into the positions and into the actions that they wanted them to do. And we are speaking here about innumerable Protestants that we will deal with later on in this reading. We are dealing with Wycliffe, Tyndale, Lord, uh, Latimer, um, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer, Melanchthon, I can't name them all, but it is very important to understand that the author says here it pleased God in his good providence, because after all, God is in control. Never ever forget that, whatever happens. God is in control, and this is proof of it. It pleased God <clears throat> in his good providence to take the remedy and cure of these evils into his own hand, and after fruitless attempts of by men, to bring about, at last, a reformation of religion by his own wisdom and power. The history of this great event, the Reformation, hath been very particularly and faithfully given by many excellent writers, to which I must here refer my readers. 
and it must be owned that the persons employed by Almighty God to accomplish this great work, the Reformation, were, many of them, remarkable for their learning and exemplary piety. I am sure I have no inclination to distract from their worth and, uh, and merit. One would indeed have imagined that the cruelties exercised by the papists upon all who opposed their superstitions and worship and their corruptions and doctrine should have given the first reformers an utter abhorrence of all methods of persecution for conscience sake and have kept them from ever entering into any such measures themselves. But it must be confessed that however that however they differed from the Church of Rome as to doctrines and uh, discipline, yet that they too generally agreed with her in the, methods of, uh, in the methods to support what they themselves apprehended to be truth and orthodoxy, and were angry with the papists for not persecuting but for persecuting themselves and their, uh, not for persecuting, but for persecuting themselves and their followers, being really of opinion that heretics might be persecuted and, in some cases, persecuted to death, and that this was their avowed principle, they gave abundant demonstration by their practice. Now, before I continue and we go a little bit into into Luther. And I have to say that I agree with a lot of the things that Luther says here, but I also do not agree with a lot of things that Luther or any other so-called Protestant says here. When we are speaking about what the author says, that this was their avowed principle, they gave abundant demonstration by their practice, meaning heretics might be persecuted. Really? Heretics might be persecuted? Where did Jesus persecute heretics? He didn't. He left them over to their fate. You know? We are not to persecute people because of religion, because of their faith. That is exactly what the Antichrist does. That's what the Antichrist did all throughout the ages. That's the reason why this book was written. The book is over nothing else but the persecution of quote-unquote heretics, meaning people who have a different belief than that that is imposed on them by the Roman Catholic Church. When we as Protestants set ourselves rules, let's call them, how to persecute people who think otherwise than we do, who do not put the Bible first, who do not put God first, who do not only believe in the Bible, sola scriptura, when we do that and we persecute these people, then we are no better than they who persecuted us all through the ages. It is not on us to persecute them. You want to correct them in their faith. But we know that everything is working by God's election. So there are people that God did not elect. You cannot turn them. So what are you going to do? Kill them? Well, the Bible says, do not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Okay? So when I can't do that, I have to leave them. I can cast them out of my providence and say, you live anywhere you want, but not here in my community in my society where we live according to the word of God go live somewhere else but leave us alone we are not to persecute heretics but I think we will go in the future in this book here in the reading a little bit about what the different uh, reformers were thinking of the part that I was just discussing. And I just want to make sure that you understand my standpoint very well. If I accuse my persecutors because they persecute me of my belief system, when I accuse my persecutors here, and I 
persecute them in the same way that they persecute me, then I am no better than them. And then I have not even deserved to call myself a Christian. Because I should love my neighbor, but I should also love my enemy. And what is love but respect? I mean, when my enemy deserves to die, it is not on me to take his life, but on the one who gave his life, on God. God will judge in the end, not me. Heretics must be persecuted. That's what the Roman Catholic Church says. We Protestants should not take over that creed, because then we are no better than they are. But let's continue. Luther, the author continues here, the great instrument under guard of the Reformation in Germany was, as his followers allow, naturally of a warm and violent temper, but was, however, in his judgment against punishing heretics with death. So, that's where I absolutely agree with Luther. Thus, in his account of the state of the Popish Church, as related by Seckendorf, he says, this is Martin Luther, quote, The true church, what is the true church? The true church are Bible-believing, sola scriptura, adhering, Jesus-following Christians, the saints and the martyrs that were named in Revelation 17. Those are the true church. The true church, Martin Luther says, teaches the word of God, but forces no one to it. Jesus Christ never forced any person to believe in him. Oh, he was doing signs and wonders so that people would believe who he was by at least seeing the signs and wonders, but he never forced anyone into the religion of the Creator God. The true Church teaches the Word of God, but forces no one to it, Luther says. And he continues, if anyone will not believe it, he dismisses him and separates him, herself from him, according to the command of Christ and the example of Paul in the Acts, and leaves him to the judgment of God. Whereas our executioners and most cruel tyrants teach not the word of God, but their own articles acting as they please, and then uh, adjudge those who refuse to believe their articles and obey their decrees to be to the fires." Unquote. So this what Martin Luther said here, I think is very, and I, I think you understand that is very, very important. This is absolutely biblical, and he even refers to the Bible, he refers to Paul in Acts, and leave it to the judgment of God. It is not on us to judge these people, it is on God to judge. If anyone will not believe it, he dismisses him and separates himself from him according to the commandment of Christ. The Bible says that we should separate ourselves from the heathens, from the people who do not take the quote-unquote religion of the true Creator God. On different places in the New Testament that is stated. That's it. Just separate yourself from them. Don't have any communion with them. How can two walk to together lest they agreed, as it is said in Amos? Right? So, separate yourself from them. This sentence, this quote from Martin Luther here, is absolutely biblical and I 100% sustain every word that he says here. I'm going to repeat it without any comment, that you can understand it. I hope very well. Luther says, quote, 
The true church teaches the word of God, but forces no one to it. If anyone will not believe it, she dismisses him and separates herself from him, according to the command of Christ and the example of Paul in the Acts, and leaves him to the judgment of God. Whereas our executioners and most cruel tyrants teach not the word of God, but their own articles, acting as they please, and then adjudge those who refuse to believe their articles and obey their decrees to the fires. Unquote. I hope that this sentence sinks in. The same author this is second off, gives us many other strong passages to the same purpose, particularly in one of his letters to Linkus, who asked his opinion, that's Martin Luther's opinion, about the punishment of false teachers. Now Luther says, quote, I am very averse to the shedding of blood, even in the case of such as deserve it. And I the more especially dreaded in this case, because the, uh, as the Papists and Jews under this pretense have destroyed holy prophets and innocent men. So I am afraid the same would happen amongst, it, uh, amongst ourselves, if in one single instance it should be allowed lawful for seducers to be put to death. I can therefore by no means allow that false teachers should be destroyed. Unquote. This sentence is as important as the sentence that I just read before. Another quote from Luther, Luther that we really have to let very well sink into our minds to understand it. He says, I am very averse to the shedding of blood even in the case of such as deserve it. So there is no denial of Luther that there are people who deserve their blood to be shed, but he is not the one that sheds their blood. His belief system, real biblical Christianity, does not allow to hurt any man. And when you want to shed the blood of any man, you have to hurt him. And Christ said, do not hurt any man. And Luther is very, very strict biblical here, and I just love it, because there are so many people who say that he has fallen off of this. But take this, what he says here, and measure Luther on what he says here, probably in his very early time. I am very averse to the shedding of blood, even in the case of such as deserve it. And I the more especially dreaded in this case because as the papists and Jews under this pretense have destroyed holy prophets and innocent men. So that means that Luther says, well, there is abundance of proof where in the past, well, whether the papists or in the Old Testament, the Jews destroyed holy prophets and innocent men. Well, who is about to judge if someone is a prophet or an innocent man? It is not on us, it is on God. And it is on God to take their lives, and it is not on us, to uh, on us to take their lives. So Luther continues, I am afraid the same would happen amongst ourselves, if in one single instance it should be allowed lawful for seducers to be put to death. I can therefore by no means allow that false teachers should be destroyed. And I applaud his opinion in this. But as to all other punishments, Luther seems to have been of Austin's mind and thought that they, made, that they might be lawfully used. For after the before-mentioned passages, he adds, quote, "'Tis sufficient that they should be banished." That's what I said already earlier. Just put them out of your congregation. Put them into the wilderness. Let them live wherever they want, but not in our congregation. It is sufficient that they should be banished. And in another place he allows that, quote, heretics may be corrected and forced at least to silence 
if they publicly deny any one of the articles received by all Christians, and particularly that Christ is God, affirming him to be a mere man or prophet. This, says he, is not to force men to the faith, but to restrain public blasphemy. So, this is where Luther says, and I absolutely sustain him in this, we have to forcome that blasphemy spreads through our congregation, through our church, through our community. And therefore we have the right to shut those people up. But we don't have to use violence to do that. And that's exactly what Luther says here. It is sufficient that they should be banished. The heretics may be corrected and forced at least to silence if they publicly deny one of the articles. Jesus said, who denies the Father denies the Son. So when there is something in your Christian community who denies the Father and by that denies the Son, isn't that a reason to shut him up? Isn't that a reason to expel him from your community? Well, that's all Luther says. And he is absolutely right with that. When you are affirming to Christ to be a mere man or prophet. This, says he, is not to force men to the faith, but to rest uh, so when he, um, when the heretic says that Jesus Christ was, was just a mere man, or Jesus Christ was just a prophet, that is what the people in Islam, that is what the, uh, what the Muslims, what the Islamic religion teaches, that Jesus Christ was just a prophet, well, then shut him out of your community. That's all Luther says. He doesn't say, shoot him, hang him, flay them, kill them. No. Shut him up. Put them out of your community. And that's it. In another place, he goes a little bit farther and says that, quote, heretics are not indeed to be put to death but may, however, be confined and shut up in some certain place and put under restraint as madmen. As to the Jews, he was for treating them more severely and was of opinion that their synagogues should be leveled with the ground and their houses destroyed, their books of prayer and of the Talmud and even those of the Old Testament be taken from them, their rabbis be forbid to teach and forced by hard labor to get their bread. And if they would not submit to this, that they should be banished, as was formerly practiced in France and in Spain. Again, I do not find any fault in the teaching of Luther in this regard. That their synagogues should be leveled with the ground. In the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, as it is better called, when the Israelites went into the heathen countries and destroyed the heathen countries to later possess that land because God promised it to them. They were to destroy the heathen temples and altars and images. Nothing else Luther says or orders here from us. We have to destroy the synagogues because the synagogues are a temple of worship for Satan, not the true creator God of the Bible. And therefore I sustain the meaning of Luther when he says that their synagogues should be leveled with the ground because they are no more worth than any other pagan temple because their synagogues are pagan temples. God does not dwell in houses or temples made by the hand of man, right? So what do you need synagogues for anyway? What do you need churches for anyway? The same. Flap them too, the churches, I say. That their synagogues should be leveled with the ground, their houses destroyed, their books of prayer, and of the Talmud, very important, and of the Talmud, even those of the Old Testament, be taken from them, because they are all, um, the books of the Old Testament, of the Jews, here are corrupted. They are not the correct translations anymore that we have in the uh, King James Bible of 1611. 
their scriptures have been corrupted. That's why they still remain in their belief system. Because otherwise, if the Jews would really, the re, uh, really read the real Old Testament, to put it that way, they would know who Jesus Christ is. They would have known when their Messiah came. And we would not even be talking about Jews and Gentiles, but we were speaking about the whole body of Christ, where there is no Jew or Gentile anymore. The rabbis be forbid to teach, of course, because I cannot allow anyone to teach false gospel. That is blasphemy. And the rabbis should be forbidden to teach, as should all Roman Catholic preachers, priests, be forbidden to preach. And all apostate, quote-unquote, Reformation pastors should be forbidden to teach. If they do not teach the word of God, forbid them to teach anything. And forced by hard labor to get their bread. Yeah, absolutely. We all have to work to get our bread, as God ordained after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, remember? We have to till the ground and get our bread out of there. And if they would not submit to this, that they should be banished, as was formerly practiced. Absolutely. Hey, you don't want to live to the rule of God? Well, then live anywhere else, but not in, with, uh, within our congregation. Not within our society. It's easy as that. This was the moderation of this otherwise great and good men who was indeed against putting heretics to death, but for almost all other punishments that the evil magistrate could inflict. And, agreeably to this opinion, he persuaded the electors of Saxony not to tolerate in their dominion the followers of Zwingilus, in the opinion of, um, of the sacrament, because he esteemed the real presence and if, uh, essential or fundamental article of faith nor to enter into any terms of union with them for their common safety and defense against the endeavors of the papists to destroy them. And accordingly, notwithstanding all the endeavors of the landgrave of Hesse, uh, of Hesse Castle, to get them included in the common league against the papists, the elector would never allow it, being vehemently dissuaded from, uh, from it by Luther. Melanchthon and others of their party who alleged that, quote, that they taught articles contrary to those received in Saxony, and that therefore there could be no agreement of heart with them. Unquote. In one of these conferences with Bucer, he declared that there could be no union unless Zingulius uh, Zing and his party should think and teach otherwise. I think that this Zwinglis maybe refers to Zwingli. It's just a little bit differently written. Let's see if that is correct. I don't know. And teach otherwise, cursing all phrases and interpretations that tended to, if, uh, to assert the figurative presence only, affirming that either those of his own opinion or those of Zwinglius must be the ministers of the devil. On this account, taught Luther, was for treating Zwinglis and his followers with as much Christian friendship as he could afford them. Yet he would never own them for brethren, but looked on them as heretics, and pressed the electors of Saxony not to allow them in their dominions. He also wrote to Albert, Duke of Prussia, to, pers uh, to persuade him to banish them with, uh, hi uh, at his territories. Seckendorf also tells us that the Lutheran lawyers of Wittenberg condemned to death one Peter Pestilius for being a Zwinglian, though, it was, uh, though this was disapproved by the elector of Saxony. Several also of the Anabaptists were put to death by the Lutherans for their obstinacy and propagating their errors contrary to the judgment of the landgrave of Hesse Castle, who declared himself for more moderate measures, and for uniting all sorts of Protestants among themselves. Well, according to what I just read here, I have to make a little comment. If you have the possibility to watch a movie about Luther and his life, um, 
there's one movie that you can find on the internet that is called Luther. Uh, it is with Ralph Fiennes playing the leading role. And that movie is, if I'm not mistaken, from 2004. And I don't say that that is a perfect movie, but that is a nice movie where you can really understand a little bit of the working of Luther. And there is a scene in when, of course, he put the Reformation into practice in Germany. And he told all the people that they were actually free because they don't need a king, a king that is just there because the Pope put him there and the Pope is the Antichrist. The people, mainly the lay people, the farmers, got so-called freed from the yoke of Rome. But on the other hand, they took justice in their own hands. And they were starting wars in Germany. Uprisings, rebellions, revolutions, because these people thought they, they were avenging themselves on the yoke that was put upon them. And that, of course, is wrong. We know that is not Christian. So, we just read here before a few sentences that Luther is absolutely against violence. But Luther is not the leader of all the peasants in Germany, is not the leader of all the lay people. So when they do this, and this is said here, Anabaptists were put to death by the Lutherans, well, the Lutherans were just people who followed Luther and not Luther himself. Luther is not responsible for what people do who quote-unquote follow him. The Bible says that we should follow no man. Not Luther, not Swingley, not Calvin, not Wycliffe, not Tyndale. No man. And no Pope, of course. We should follow God. So when the author says here, of course, that several also Anabaptists were put to death by the Lutherans, you cannot make Luther himself responsible for that because he said not to kill them, but the people who quote-unquote follow him take the law, take the right into their own hands. That is not the fault of Luther. Look, when, when I sit here and tell you the truth about this lying antichrist system, and I teach you of that, and I show you the errors of that system, and the lies of the system, and the betrayal of the Antichrist world that we are living in. Do I, by that, give you the right to kill everybody around you who works for that system? Of course not. Because the Bible says we should love our enemies, and we have one sword to fight with, the two-edged sword, the word of God. That's what we should use to fight error and lies and deception in this world. And not violence. So when there were many, many people who took up the sword because they wanted to quote-unquote defend the teachings of Luther, wanted to quote-unquote defend Christianity, well then don't take up a carnal sword in the first place, otherwise it means that you just did not understand anything that the Bible, that the Reformation taught. And here you have, of course, from different Protestants, from different Reformers, different point of views. I do not agree with any of them, because the only point of view that I agree with is the Bible. And when we read here about Lutherans, and we will read about Calvinists, people who follow Calvin, and people who follow other uh, reformers, other Protestants, don't follow any man. Follow Jesus Christ. That must be your first order. And there, a lot of people are wrong. And don't follow any man. Don't follow me. You have a fool for a leader. I'm no better than you. So why follow me? Follow Christ. And this is what they should have done here also. Okay, let's see. John Calvin, another of the reformers, and to whom the Christian world... Um, is, on many accounts, under very great obligations, was, however, well known to be in principle and practice a persecutor. So, Calvin was completely different in this kind of approach 
than, for example, Luther was. Luther was anti-violence, not killing, banishing the people, but not persecuting them. Calvin, on the other hand, had another principle. And I tell you right now, without even reading into this, I haven't read this before, I want to tell you right now, whatever Calvin does is not biblical. So entirely was he in the, perfect, uh, in the persecuting measures that he wrote a treatise in defense of them, maintaining the lawfulness of putting heretics to death. No! You are wrong! You have no right to kill anybody! That's only the right of God. He who gives life can take life, not anybody else. You have no law in the Bible to put heretics to death. Point. Otherwise you make up laws. Well, the papists are very good in that. They don't do anything else. They just do make up laws. Are we the same? Are we called to do the same? Make up our own laws? Or are we professing Jesus Christ and by that adhering to his laws? He is the establisher of laws, not we. And here, this is one of the reasons why you have so many quote-unquote denominations in the world. Because people like to listen to this person, other people like to listen to that person, other people like to listen to that person. And there you have diversity. Yeah? You have the splitting up of the body of Christ. Because then the people all of a sudden go along and make their own rules. That's already what put apostasy into the Roman Catholic Church. Because they were departing from the law of God, making their own, uh, their own rules, their own laws. That's not the way it should be. So whatever we read here, please consider that when I just read that and not always do the comment here. I do not agree with anything that is said here. So entirely was he, Calvin, persecu uh, in the persecuting measures that he wrote a treatise in defense of them maintaining the lawfulness of putting heretics to death. Well, the lawfulness of putting heretics to death, those are the same that I can say that's what the Jesuits did. They make it lawful to put heretics to death also because of equivocation, because of mental reservation because of all the things that they adhere to. Well, if I do the same thing, then I am no better than the Jesuits. Then I am no better than the heretics either. Because I don't adhere to the law of God that says, do not kill. How difficult is that to understand? Do harm to no man, Jesus Christ said. Thou shalt not kill. Jesus Christ said. How difficult is that to understand? So when we read in this year, of course, I condemn everybody, Calvin, even Luther, if he later changed his opinion. If they all of a sudden advocate putting heretics to death. I do not agree with that. I strongly oppose that in the strongest terms. And that by heretics, he meant such who differed from himself, is evident from his treatment of Castelio and Servitus. He meant such who differed from himself. So, he meant such who differed from himself. He doesn't mean such who differ from the Bible. Because if he... Calvin, that is, bases himself on the Bible, sola scriptura, then he has no right to put any quote-unquote heretic to death. He meant such who differed from himself. Well, this is a very important distinction. Differ from Calvin's point of view is one thing, differ from the Bible's point of view is another. So, what does Calvin do here? He actually makes himself a Pope. He puts himself above the law of God and puts out his own law. By heretics he meant such who differed from himself. 
No. Heretics are those who differ from the Bible. This means that Calvin took the law in his own hands. He makes himself God. Calvin is wrong! I hope you get it. Calvin is wrong. He meant by heretics such who differed from himself. We're going to continue next time on the bottom of page 62 to go a little bit more into Calvin and the rest of the reformers that will come up here. But I think Calvin is the subject of the next few pages. And we will see that. I hope I made my point very, very clear in this book reading today. The Bible and the Bible alone. No law of Luther, no law of Calvin, no law of Zwingli, no law of the Pope. The law of God. The law of the Bible. And when Calvin says that he persecutes, as it is said here, by heretics he meant such who differed from himself, well then he is in error because he is not there to make any laws and to establish any laws and to establish who is a heretic and who is not. God establishes that and God will take care of them. So I hope you enjoyed these few pages of reading of the history of the Inquisition with all my comments in there. Whether you agree or you don't agree, I will probably read that later on in the comment section of the video because I leave that, of course, the comments open and I will try to think of putting all the interesting links that I told you from Wikipedia and newadvent.org into the description box of the video and still I remain saying, I cannot say it often enough, please do your own research. Rely on books, rely on Wikipedia, rely on the Catholic Encyclopedia or rely on any other Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, Webster's uh, Dictionary from 1828, whatever you can. Take all the sources that you can and check these sources against the truth of the Bible. And do your own research, because it is only your own understanding that can help you understand the past, the history that we were reading with the book here of the history of the Inquisition, to understand the present and make predictions to the future, based on the Bible, the 1611 authorized King James Version of the Bible, the only true preserved word of God in these times, 2017. So thank you very much for watching, for listening, for commenting, and until next time, may God keep and bless you. Jogna 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off. Bye-bye.